Jeff Zwerink, and welcome again to Give and Take. This is the segment of our show where we look at just fascinating and the latest scientific ideas and how we can use those to be more confident in the truth of Christianity. Today I'm joined by my uh, boss and president of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to investigate how the sun's mass affects life here on Earth. Hugh, it's nice to have you on the show again today. Thank you. So we think of the sun as being something very stable. I mean, it's basically every morning it comes up, looks pretty much the same all the, day, all the time. But yet you're kind of arguing that it's unstable or that it changes over time. What are some of the ways that it changes? Well, it doesn't change much over our lifespan, Jeff. That's but over good to billions know. <laughs> of years, it does change. Okay, and in what ways does it change? Well, the sun is producing energy through hydrogen fusion, basically the hydrogen bomb mechanism, where it's fusing hydrogen into helium. Okay. And as it fuses hydrogen to helium, helium being more dense than hydrogen, it increases the density of the nuclear furnace core of the sun. So kind of the way to think about that, the hydrogen's filling the sun, but because helium is more dense, it'll float down to the center, or it'll sink down to the center, if you will. Well, the core is where the hydrogen's being converted right. into helium. Okay. So that process by itself will increase the density of the core. Okay. And as that density gets greater and greater, it makes the nuclear furnace of the sun burn progressively more and more efficient. Okay. And so over the past 3.8 billion years history of life, the sun has gotten brighter by about 20 to 22 percent. Okay, so I could see why the luminosity or the brightness is going to change because of that, but you're talking about the mass changing. I mean, this is all happening in the core, so it can't be changing the mass significantly, can it's it? It's not changing the mass significantly. It is true that the sun's luminosity is very sensitive to the sun's mass, but the sun has lost very little mass over the history of the Earth. Okay. So the really big effect is what's happening in the nuclear furnace, the conversion of hydrogen to helium. Uh, that alone explains why it brightens by about 20 to 22 percent. So, so you're saying over the last roughly four billion years or since Earth's been around, uh, if we were to go back about four billion years ago, the, Earth, the sun would be how much dimmer? Well, if you go back 4 billion years, it's probably 23, 24% dimmer. History of life, about 20 to 22% change. That seems like a huge effect. I mean, we're it talking is. 1 or 2% change now would be catastrophic to a lot of life. It would. And so the big question is, it's called the faint sun paradox. How is it that life has persisted on Earth for 3.8 billion years when life can only tolerate about a 1% change in the sun's luminosity? And here's the sun getting brighter by at least 20%. Okay, so we've got Earth, and unless we're going to move Earth's in its orbit, which we have pretty good reason to think that hasn't happened, at least not for quite a while, um, you've got the sun that's getting progressively brighter over the last three and a half to four billion years. What is it that keeps Earth's atmosphere from just getting incredibly hot and boiling all the oceans away? Well, the suggestions you got from people like Carl Sagan 40, 50 years ago was that the greenhouse gases were much more... Uh, abundant when the sun was dim than it is today. Okay, so f kind of remind us all again, what are the greenhouse gases or what do they do? Well, carbon dioxide, water vapor, methane, they trap heat from the sun. So if you got more carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, for example, it'll trap more of the incoming heat and basically explains why the surface temperature of the Earth 3.8 billion years ago was as warm as it is today. Well, yeah. before we get in there, I think it's just important to point out is, you know, that if we don't have this greenhouse effect right now, the surface temperature of the Earth would actually be below the freezing point of water. It would. So it, it heats it up about 30 degrees Celsius, That's correct, Celsius, 30 degrees correct? centigrade, right. You know, yeah. So it, it's a pretty big effect that that's going on. And so, mm -hmm. so it's not just how bright the sun is, it's how bright the sun is, how far away the Earth is, and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Yeah, that the affect... real effect is what is the temperature of the surface of the Earth. Right, okay. And what compensates for the dimmer sun is you've got more greenhouse gases. However, in the intervening 50 years, we realize that alone will not explain how life has been here for 3.8 billion years. The extra greenhouse gases help, but it's not enough. Okay, so go back early in Earth's history, there's going to be greenhouse gases that are presumably more efficient at trapping the well, sunlight. Well, much more abundant than they are today. Much more abundant, much more efficient, so it's going to warm things up, but it's not adequate to keep the Earth in a liquid water zone, or a zone where liquid water is going to be present on the surface of the Earth. So what else needs to happen there? 
Well, you mean both of us have been at conferences where this paradox has been discussed, and I think you're aware there's been debates. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we need to speed up the rotation of the Earth 30 in its history? Mm -hmm. Is it more continental coverage? Uh, do we need to change the weathering effects? Because Well, let's explore some of those. So, so we change the continental coverage. What's that going to do? Well, by having less continental coverage, uh, you're going to actually be uh, absorbing more heat uh, from the sun, so it'll help keep the temperature going. So, so the oceans being darker are going to absorb more water than like desert areas, which would reflect yeah, more of that light. Yeah, open ocean water uh, only reflects sunlight with six percent efficiency. Mm -hmm. Land mass is between ten and thirty percent. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so more oceans going to absorb more of the heat, it's absorb independent more of, the of the greenhouse heating, independent of the greenhouse effect. Okay. And an improbable planet actually listed sixteen different factors that could help have the Earth's surface warmer with mm -hmm. a dimmer sun. And the question is, well, which of those 16 are the right answer? And bottom line is, I think you need at least 14 of the 16 all working together in just the right way, or you're not gonna have life being able to proliferate the Earth's surface for 3.8 billion years. Yeah. You, you need know, that, to fine tune that, a lot more than just one thing. No, that's that's actually a very fascinating thing. It's not just okay. We've got to find a planet with the right distance from a star. The sun, the, the luminosity of the star is going to change, and so what's going on on the planet also has to be changing commensurate with what's going on. And I know you've mentioned in other places, and I, I find this particularly fascinating that not only does the amount of radiation impact the kind of life that's there, but the kind of life impacts how the temperature of the planet as well. Well, you notice when you look at the fossil record, we see plant life as progressively uh, more efficient in hastening what's called silicate weathering. Okay. Silicate weathering is a mechanism that takes place on the Earth that pulls carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you go from algae to trees, you find that these trees can pull about four times as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than the algae can. And it's one reason why God waits a while before he puts trees on the face of the earth. Because it's like, okay, here's the sun getting brighter and brighter. Uh, we're going to need to pull more of these greenhouse gases of the atmosphere. And at just the right time, we got just the right life and just the right diversity and abundance to perfectly compensate for the changing physics of the sun. And I've used that as an argument. Clearly, that points to a mind that knows the future physics of the sun to know which life to have on the planet and which life to remove. Well, thank you, Hugh. I appreciate your comments. You know, it really is the case that the more we look at the history of Earth, the history of life on Earth, the history of how the sun has behaved, we see an amazing degree of fine-tuning and coordination in how the sun changes, what's going on in Earth's atmosphere, and the types of life on the planet, so that Earth maintains this capacity to host an abundant and diverse variety of life. You know, I would encourage you to go check out Hugh's article on this topic. Go to reasons.org and look for his article titled, How the Sun's Mass Affected Earth's History of Life. You will get a great wealth of information that will equip you to see the mind and God's creativity and design as he's fashioned this earth for us to live on.